This meeting is being recorded. Hi, so today, uh, good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is on contract law and it's the learning outcome uh, three, which is to understand the sort of rotating elements that um, may affect the validity of a contract. Um, and we will be looking at learning outcome three. Last week, we looked at learning outcome two, uh, which was to understand the rules that govern the content of a contract. Uh, we also looked at the terms of a contract, implied and expressed terms, with reference to uh, legal cases. So today we're going to be looking at the identifying the elements of an actionable misrepresentation. So uh, misrepresentation is a form of statement made prior to uh, any contract being formed. There are two types of statements that can be made before a contract forms. Um, these will either be in the form part, will either form part of the contract or not form part of the contract, therefore becoming a representation. Uh, misrepresentation is a false statement um, of fact made by one party to another, which whilst not being not a term of the contract, induces the other party to enter into the contract. An actionable misrepresentation must be a false statement of fact, not of opinion or future intention or law. Silence does not amount to misrepresentation. However, the representer must not, mis must not misleadingly tell only one part of the truth, thus a statement that does not present the whole truth may be a misrepresentation. Um, thus, a statement that does not present the whole truth may be uh, present a misrepresentation, where a statement was true when it was made, but due to a change of circumstances becomes false, there's a duty to disclose the change. So a misrepresentation may be fraudulent made, which is made unknowingly uh, without belief in its truth or recklessness, uh, negligent, which is made by a person who had no reasonable grounds to believe that it was true, or innocent, which is made in the wholly innocent belief that it was true. The misrepresentation must have induced at least partly the party to enter into the contract and must have relied on it to at least some degree by the person to whom it was made. If that person in fact relies on his own judgments or investigations or simply ignores the misrepresentation, then it cannot give rise to an action against the person who made the misrepresentation. So the difference between fraudulent, negligent and innocent. So as we mentioned, there were three types, fraudulent, negligent and innocent. Um, firstly, fraudulent misrepresentation. Um, uh, the significance of misrepresentation being classified as a fraudulent one is that the measure of damages may be greater under certain circumstances. There are two remedies available for fraudulent misrepresentation, recession and damages. Representees should attempt a claim for fraudulent misrepresentation with caution as the courts impose a much higher standard of proof due to the serious allegations um, there may also be penalties in the event that the claim is not made out. 
a fraudulent misrepresentation was defined in the case of Derry and Peak, 1889, um, as a false statement which is made knowingly or without belief in its truth or recklessness, careless whether it should it be true or false. Uh, in this case, the facts of the case were a special act incorporating some provisions of Tramways Act 1870 and three tramway companies provided that these complaints could use animal power to move their carriage on the tramway or with the consent of the Board of Trade by steam or any mechanical power for fixed period. Pursuant to this act, one company issued a prospectus prospectus stating that the new act in place is fully expected that by means of a considerable saving will result in the working expenses of of the line as compared with other tramways worked by horses the respondent relied upon the statement and purchased the shares of the company however subsequently the board of trade refused to grant the permission or using of using steam power to the company Therefore, the respondent bought an action of deceit against the company on the grounds of fraudulent misrepresentation. The appellants made allegedly to induce him to obtain the shares of the company. The issue in this case was that did the company's untrue statement amount to fraudulent misrepresentation? And it was held in this case, um, reversing the decision of the Court of Appeal, the House of Lords held that although false statement might be evidence of fraud, it does not, not necessarily amount to fraud. As per Lord Herschel, fraud is proved when it's shown that a false uh, representation has been made knowingly or without belief in its truth or recklessly careless whether it be true or false. Although the statements were indeed false, the company made them in belief that they were true in an action of deceit, the claimant has to prove the actual fraud. Therefore, the defendants were not liable and the appeal was Then there are some other examples in the case, the first one being uh, Thomas Witter Limited against TBP Industries. And this case clarified that where a statement is made where the statement maker has no idea whether or true, whether it is true or false, this statement would be fraudulent due to the recklessness asserting it is true when it may not be. In this case, uh, the defendant was a conglomerate organisation that negotiated to sell a carpet company to the plaintiff. During the negotiation of the sale of the company, the defendant made a negligent representation that there would be a one-off expense of £120,000 in accounts, but that this spread the cost of producing the accounts over two years rather than writing the cost off completely. The contract of sale also included a clause which stated that the plaintiff acknowledged that they had not entered into the agreement on the basis of any representation or warranty made by the defendant. The plaintiff claimed for negligent misrepresentation on the basis that the statement regarding the accounts that was made by the defendant was inaccurate and the defendant attempted to rely on the limitation clause in the agreement between the parties. The issue in this case for the court was to understand whether the defendant could rely on the limitation clause in the contract. If the defendant could rely on this clause, then this would enable him to avoid liability for representation that had been made during the negotiation of the sale. The court found in favour of the plaintiff. It did so because the clause regarding the misrep uh, sorry the representation could not have effect as per the Misrepresentation Act 1967, Section 1, and the Misrepresentation Act 1967, Section 3, as the clause attempted to exclude all forms of misrepresentation, including fraudulent misrepresentation from the agreement. Moreover, the court found that the clause only applied to breaches of contractual agreement and did not apply to inducing the plaintiff into the agreement. The next one is the true statements which became false. 
Um, and in the case of uh, With Against or Flanagan 1936, it was suggested that misrepresentation as a result of a change of circumstances might result either in a fraudulent misrepresentation or a negligent one. Here are the circumstances in which this can happen. Um, so in this case, the claimant uh, purchased a medical practice from the defendant. The claimant was induced to buy the practice by the defendant's statement that the practice took £2,000 per annum. This statement was true at the time it was made. However, subsequently, the defendant became ill and many patients went elsewhere. By the time the sale was completed, the practice was virtually worthless. It was held that where a statement is rendered false by a change in circumstances, there is a duty to disclose the change. A failure to do so will result in an actionable misrepresentation. So when we look at fraudulent misrepresentation, the statement maker is aware that there's a duty to notify the representative of a change of circumstances, um, as in the Banks and Cox case, uh, number two, and then negligent statement that the statement maker is not aware that there's a duty to notify the representative of a change of circumstances. So the next one to look at is negligent misrepresentation. Um, and uh, this uh, is where a claim for negligent misrepresentation that is based in tort under common law is usually referred to as negligent misstatement. And this was in the case of Hadley Bryan and Co Limited against Heller Partners, 1964. In this case, the House of Lords stated that a bitter that there could be a liability for negligent misrepresentation on the normal principles of tort, where there was a special relationship between the parties. A special relationship would only give rise where the matter of a false statement has, no, has some knowledge relevant to the subject matter. And uh, negligent misrepresentation was actually um, established in the Headley case. Um, the other case in regards to negligent misrepresentation is the case of Caparo Industries uh, PLC against Dickman 1990, and this looked at the test for a duty of care. So in this case, uh, the facts are that Caparo Industries purchased shares in Fid uh, Fidelity PLC in reliance of the accounts which stated that the company had made a pre-tax profit of 1.3 million. In fact, Fidelity had made a loss of over £400,000. Caparo brought an action against the auditors, claiming that they were negligent in certifying the accounts. It was held that, as stated earlier, that there was no duty of care was owed. There was no sufficient proximity between Caparo and the auditors, since the auditors were not aware of the existence of Caparo, nor the purpose for which the accounts were being used. Lord Bridge um, identified the Caparo test in this, the Caparo case was what he identified was what emerges is that in addition to the foreseeability of damage, necessary ingredients in any situation giving rise to a duty of care are that there should exist between the party owing the duty and the party to whom it owed a relationship categorized by the law of as one of proximity or neighborhood and that the situation should be one in which the court considers it fair, just and reasonable, and the law should impose a duty of a given scope upon one party for the benefit of the other. Uh, then subsequent case law uh, was considered um, and negligence of misrepresentation in the context of a duty of care concluded that there would be a duty of care owed there was an assumption of responsibility on part of the statement maker. Um, and this was as in the case of uh, Henderson and Merit Syndicates uh, Limited, 1995. Um, and uh, in this case, it was whether or not there's an assumption of responsibility considers determining whether the statement maker has had themselves out as possessing expertise or skill special skill and is aware that the other party will rely on this information. It is re irrelevant whether or not the statement maker is an actual expert, only that they hold themselves out by one 
Uh, so just in regards to the Henderson case, um, uh, it, the facts of the case is that the members of Lloyd Syndicate brought an action against the underwriting agents, um, the managers of these syndicates. Furthermore, the syndicate members uh, alleged that the agents negligently managed their syndicates, which exposed them to unreasonable financial loss. Uh, moreover, the relationship between the claimants and the agents were governed by the agency agreements, terms of which implied that duty, due care and skill needed to be exercised by the agents when managing claimants' affairs. <clears throat> the issue that came out uh, of this case, as mentioned uh, from the slides, is that did firstly, did the agents owe the duty of care in tort to claimants despite their control? contractual relationship. Secondly, um, were the agents responsible for the lack of skill or care shown to sub-agents who the agents appointed? It was uh, held in this case uh, by the House of Lords who dismissed the agents' appeal. Lord Gough considered that the headley Bryan principle of voluntary assumption of responsibility could give rise to a claim in tort in contractual situations the House held that the duty of care to exercise reasonable skill in tort arises when one party um, undertakes a professional or quasi-professional services for the other. Um, such a duty arises in tort despite the contractual relationship of the parties. Moreover, the headley Bryan special relationship did not only apply to giving information and advice, but also the provision of services Therefore, as the House established the voluntary assumption of responsibility to the claimants, there was no need to apply Caparo test to decide whether it was fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty. Lastly, the practical result of this was that the claimants who had available remedies both in contract and tort could choose that remedy, which appears to him to be the most advantageous thing. Negligent misrepresentation continued. An alternative approach to a claim for negligent misrepresentation is to pursue the claim under statute and the Misrepresentation Act 1967, section two, subsection one allows for such a claim and contain, contains the key components. Uh, the significance of a negligent misrepresentation claim under statute is that the burden of proof from the common law claim is reversed. The representer cannot escape liability simply by proving that he was not neg negligent. It must be proven that the, he had reasonable grounds to believe the statement. Uh, and the case in regards to that is the case of um, Howard Marine and Dredging Company Limited against A. Ogden and Sons Excavations Limited 1978. The facts in this case were uh, Ogden Limited civil engineering contractors entered into the negotiations to hire sea barges from Howard Marine Limited, the claimants. At the meeting, the claimants marine manager basing his statement on Lloyd's register represented to the contractors the dead weight capacity of each barge to be 1,600 tonnes. In fact, number in Lloyd's register was uh, erroneous and the real capacity of the barges was 1,055 tonnes. The contact contractor did not require any further check of that matter and hired the barges under a charter party which included exceptional clause According to the clause, the hire of the barges meant that the charters had examined the barges and considered them fit for purpose. Later, the contractors discovered the correct capacity of the barges, paid partial amount of the price and refused to pay more. Consequently, claimants brought an action claiming the remaining fees. The issue in this case that was held was that A. Ogden Limited countersued claiming the damages for firstly breach of collect uh, collateral warranties in pre-contractual negotiations and secondly negligent breach of duty that arose by special relationship of the parties 
and thirdly claimants liability under section 2 subsection 1 of the misrepresentation act 1967 in this case it was held the court of appeal partly allowed the appeal by a ogden limited lord denig dissented the court held that that firstly the existence of collateral warranties in the pre-contractual negotiation was not found Secondly, as to the dead weight capacity, the misrepresentation about the most material fact was made. Additionally, claimants failed to show any objectively reasonable ground for, this, for disregarding the right uh, figure in ship's documents and preferring the figure of Lloyd's register. Thirdly, pursuant to section three of the act, since it was not fair and reasonable to rely upon the exception clause, the claimants could not escape the liability under Section 2, Subsection 1 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967. So the next one is Innocent Misrepresentation. So this is with the development of Misrepresentation Act, the claim for innocent misrepresentation is extremely limited. A claim for innocent misrepresentation will rise when a claim for negligent misrepresentation under the Misrepresentation Act has failed. The remedy for an innocent misrepresentation would usually be recession of the contract. So analyzing 3.3, uh, we're going to here analyze the development of the doctrine of duress. So duress in contract law relates to where a person enters an agreement as a result of threats. Where a party enters a contract because of duress, they may not ha they may have the contract set aside. Originally, the common law on uh, the common law only recognized threats of unlawful physical violence. However, in more recent times, the courts have recognized economic duress as giving rise to a valid claim. Where the threat is to goods, the courts have been less willing to intervene, although analogous analog claims in restitution suggest that this position of the law may change. The basis of duress as a vitigating factor uh, in contract law is that there is an absence of free consent. Duress operates at common law. Pressure not amounting to duress may give rise to an action for undue influence in equity. The effect of finding duress and undue influence is that the contract is voidable. The innocent party may rescind the contract and claim damages. The normal bars to recession operate. Then we look at undue influence, and this exists where a contract has been entered as a result of pressure, which falls short of amounting to duress. The party subject to the pressure may have a cause of action in equity to have the contract set aside on the grounds of undue influence. Undue influence operates where there exists a relationship between the parties which has been exploited by one party to gain an unfair advantage. Undue influence is divided into actual undue influence and presumed undue influence. Where a contract is found to be entered into as a result of undue influence, this will render the contract voidable. They will enable the person influenced to have the contract set aside as a result against a party which against a party who subjected the other to such influence. In addition to some instances, the party influence may be able to have a contract set aside as against a party who was not the person inflicting the, uh, the influence or pressure. Duress to the person. Where a person enters a contract as a result of threats or physical violence, the contract may be set aside, providing the threat was a cause of entering the contract. There's no need to establish that they would have not 
entered the contract but for the threat and the case in regards to that which you can actually click on to get the summary of the case but I'll go through some of the facts of the case is the case of Barton against Armstrong 1976 in this case the facts of the case are that the parties were major shareholders in a company the claimant made an agreement with the defendant that he would buy defend the defendant's shares However, however, subsequently, the claimant claimed that he agreed to the proposition uh, due to the threats made by the defendant. Uh, on the basis of duress, he claimed that the agreement was voidable. The issues in this case that were identified were that the first instance judge, the judge established that there, was, there were threats from the defendant. However, he dismissed the action as the threats were not the sole reason why the claimant entered the agreement. The Court of Appeal dismissed the plaintiff's appeal as the claimant failed to show that he had it, had it not been for the threats, he would not have made an agreement. Would the claimant succeed in Privia Council? So it was held in the Privia Council of Australia, allowed an appeal by the claimant. In Barton against Armstrong, the council held that it was up to the defendant to prove that his threats did not contribute to the claimant's decision to sign the deed. Therefore, the claimant was entitled to the relief he saw on the basis of duress by the defendant. So the next one is duress to goods. So duress to goods is not recognized as giving rise to grounds for having the contract set aside. Um, the case of uh, Skiat and Beale, uh, 1840, you could get the case summary in regards to that, but I'll give you a brief facts of the case. A promise given in return for goods that had been unlawfully detained was held to be valid. A landlord was owed money by the tenant. He, he seized goods owned by the tenant and threatened to sell them immediately unless the tenant entered into an agreement for repayment of the sums owed. The tenant agreed the repayment terms, but then sought to have the agreement set aside for duress. It was held that duress to the goods will not suffice to render a contract voidable. Um, however, this decision was received widespread criticism and is out of line with restitutionary claims. Uh, the next case is the case of Maskell against Horn in 1955. For 1915. Again, you can look at the case summary there. I will go through a little bit on the facts of the case so you have an idea of what the position was in regard to the arrest to goods in this case. So toll money was taken from the plaintiff under a threat to close down his market stall and to seize his goods if he did not pay. These tolls were in fact demanded from him with no right in law. The Court of Appeal allowed the plaintiff to recover all the toll money paid, even though the payments had been made over a considerable period of time. Lord, um, Lord uh, Reading stated that if a person pays money which is not bound to pay under a compulsion of urgent and pressing necessity of Caesar, he can recover it as money had, had and received under the law of restitution. It was held that there was a wider restitutionary rule that money paid to avoid goods being seized or to obtain the, their release could be recovered. Further, it was held that in the present case, there was a compulsory agreement to enter into, whereas in the case, the above case, Skia, the agreement was entered into voluntarily. Um, the distinction between um, C, uh, the Skia and Beal line of cases and the decision in Maskell and Horner is hard to follow and it has it has been pointed out that the peculiar result would follow that although an agreement to pay money under duress of goods is enforceable sums paid in pursuance of such an agreement by the coerced can be recovered in an action for money had and received under the law of restitution. You can look at the case summary, more on the case summaries in the links that are provided in this slide. Next one is economic duress. So the doctrine of economic duress was first canvassed by um, Justice Keir in the Sabinian and the Sibatri case, whilst the contract was not held to be voidable by duress. Um, 
Kia stated that there were exist sorry where there exists cohesion of the will uh, so as to vitiate, vitiate, vitiate consent it should be possible to um, set aside the contract however commercial pressure was not enough Um, in the Occidental Worldwide Investment Corporation um, against Skibs, the Sibian and the Sibotri, 1976, um, uh, there's a case summary you can go on in regards to that case. Uh, and then the other case to look at is the North Ocean Shipping case against Hyundai Construction. Um, uh, 1979 and I'll give you a little bit on the facts of the case even though you can actually go on to the case summary and get the links on there and the facts of the case in this one the North Ocean shipping was that shipbuilders Hyundai construction agreed to build a tanker for North Ocean shipping for a fixed price which uh, was to be paid in five installments in US dollars and um, Hyundai construction opened a letter of credit as security repayment of installments in the event of default. After the first installment was paid, the US dollars value went down by 10%. So Hyundai construction claimed a 10% increase in the building price in response. Um, North Ocean Shipping rejected the claim and paid the following two installments based on the original price. Hyundai construction returned these payments Hyundai Construction also rejected the idea of arbitration and gave an ultimatum to North Ocean Shipping. They either accept Hyundai Construction's demand for the 10% price increase or Hyundai Construction will terminate their contract. Um, the issue that was adopted from this case was at the time of the dispute, North uh, Ocean Shipping uh, was close to reaching a lucrative agreement regarding the tankers chartering so to avoid losing the deal, North Ocean um, Shipping agreed to the increase without prejudice to their rights. Um, Hyundai Constructions in turn agreed to increase the letter of credit. Uh, then North Ocean uh, Shipping stated, uh, started a claim for the return of the 10% increase a year after the tanker's delivery on grounds of economic duress. The court found in this case um, if in, in favour of Hyundai construction. Hyundai construction's increase of the result of the credit served as consideration for North Ocean shipping's increased payments under the original contract. While Hyundai construction's demand for a 10% price increase did not amount to economic pressure and made the original contract voidable, um, North Ocean's shipping payments without uh, protests affirmed the contract. So North um, Ocean Shipping's claimed uh, claim based on economic duress thus had to fail. Um, the other case that's quite important in regards to economic duress, um, which is um, also, um, if you press on the links, you could actually get uh, the case summary, but I'll go through the facts of the case. In this case, it was the case of Pao On against Lo Yu Long, 1979. This case, the claimant had threatened not to complete the main contract for the purchase of shares unless subsidiary agreements were met, including a guarantee and an indemnity. The defendant was anxious to complete the main contract as there had been a public announcement of the acquisition of shares and did not want to undermine public confidence in the company and the consequent effect on share prices. The defendant could have sued for specific performance of the agreement, but this would have delayed matters and damaged the company's reputation. The defendant had taken legal advice on all these matters before agreeing to the guarantee and indemnity. The claimant then sought to enforce the guarantee and the defendant sought to have the agreement set aside for economic duress. It was held that there was no economic duress. The Privy Council identified four factors to consider in assessing whether economic duress was present. Firstly, 
did the person claiming to be uh, claiming to be coerced protest? Secondly, did that person have any other available course of action? Thirdly, were they independently advised? And fourthly, after entering into the contract, did they take steps to avoid it? In the present case, the defendant did not protest at the time. He also could have enforced the contract of sale through specific performance and thus had another avenue of redress available to him. He had taken legal advice and took no steps to avoid the agreement prior to the claimant seeking to enforce the guarantee and therefore no economic duress could be established. It was simply commercial pressure far short of duress. Um, as mentioned earlier, the four factors that were identified in the Powell case um, are as follows, uh, which I just mentioned. The requirement of vitiation of consent was replaced in the uni universe sentinel uh, with the absence of choice in the, and the case summary is uh, identified below. Um, in this case, Lord Scarman identified the classic case of duress is, however, not the lack of will to submit, but the victim's intentional submission arising from the realisation that there is no other practical choice open to him. Accordingly, two elements of duress uh, were identified. First one being compulsion of the will, which is absence of choice, and then illegitimacy of the pressure. So the next one, slide is illegitimacy of the pressure. Initially, it was thought that the threat must be unlawful. In the case of dis, discal shipping against International Transport Workers Federation, 1991, the case summary um, is um, when you click on the link, but I can go through the facts of the case so you have more of an idea. So in this case, it was a trade dispute so the plaintiffs owned a vessel which was manned by Greeks and Filipinos when it docked at a Swedish port. An agent of ITF, um, which is the International uh, Transport Federation, informed the plaintiff that unless their workers enter into employment contracts with their crew and the ITF, the vessel would be blacked. The agent demanded the employers to be paid in accordance with ITF pay scale and that the payments be backdated. The agreement also stipulated that the association with ITF was completely voluntary on the part of the plaintiff. The plaintiff orally agreed but failed to comply with the demands resulting in the vessel being black, blackened. So they signed. The plaintiffs then bore action for duress seeking damages for the torts of intimidation and the interference with contractual rights. The ITF's actions were lawful under Swedish law, so they sought damages for a breach of contract. The issues held in the Dis Dimskal shipping case was whether duress was the reason that the plaintiffs had breached their contractual duties and whether there was duress under English law. It was held that the appeal by ITF was dismissed. The law governing the contract was found to be English law and Swedish law. This Dimskal's default in payment could be due to the duress that ITF put them under as there was nothing in English law that said that, that the blacking of a ship did not amount to duress. Thus, although the laws of the country apply to all persons as far as criminal activity is concerned, it does not apply to con to contract law where a party is entitled to rely on the law of their own country unless otherwise specified. Um, uh, the next case in regards to this was the case of CTN Cash and Carry against Gallagher 1994. Um, in this case the facts was that CTN contracted with Gallagher for the purchase of cigarettes. Gallagher delivered the cigarettes to the wrong address where they were stolen before Gallagher could rectify the mistake. The issue that was identified in this case was that Gallagher demanded CTN to pay the, for the cigarettes, despite those not being delivered due to Gallagher's own mistake. Gallagher argued that the risk had passed to CTN already when the goods were delivered to the wrong warehouse. 
Gallagher threatened to stop CTN's credit facilities for future dealings if CTN failed to pay. To prevent the loss of its credit facilities, CTN paid. However, CTN sued for the repayment on grounds of economic duress. In other words, CTN was of the view that the contract was voidable due to duress and equality of bargaining power. The decision and the outcome that was uh, um, identified in this case was that the court found against CTN. There is no doctrine of equality or bargaining power in the commercial context under common law, so the cases have to be decided on their individual facts. The court pays, based its decision on three factors. Firstly, the agreement dealings in question took place between two com commercial entities, which is two companies and not between a supplier and a consumer. Secondly, Gallagher had the right to refrain the future, from future dealings with CTN for any reason it, it choose. Thus, because a decision to discontinue dealings with CTN was lawful, it was also lawful for Gallagher to threaten CTN with credit withdrawal in the absence of payment of an invoice that was already due. Thirdly, and most importantly, Gallagher action in good faith when it demanded payment from CTN it genuinely felt entitled to the payment. In the absence of malice or any other form of bad faith, economic duress could not be established in this case. The other case you could look at and the case summaries uh, in regards to that are in the case of I against an Attorney General for England's, England and Wales 2003. And um, it was Lord Hoffman in the Privy Council suggested an approach and he suggested that the legitim illegitimacy of pressure must be examined from two aspects. Firstly, the nature of pressure, and secondly, the nature of the demand. And the pressure is applied to support. And in Lord Scarman, in the universe tank ships case, um, generally speaking, the threat of any form of unlawful action could will be regarded as illegitimate. On the other hand, that the fact the threat is lawful does not necessarily make the pressure legitimate, as Lord Atkin said in the case of Thorne against Motor Trade Association in 1937, um, where he stated that the ordinary blackmailer normally threatens to do what he has a perfect right to do, namely communicate some compromising conduct to a person whose knowledge is likely to affect the person threatened. What he has to justify is not the threat, but the demand of the money. Um, if you want to look at any of the case summaries in regards to the case, please click, click on the links uh, highlighted. So the effect of finding uh, of a finding of duress, since um, duress operates to the deflect the will of the party rather uh, than to vitiate, vitiate vitiate the consent, the effect of a finding of duress is always to make the contract voidable, not void, um, as in the case of IFR, Limited and Federal Trade Spa, and the case summary is there to have a look at in your own time. Uh, 3M1, uh, to examine the remedies available for fraudulent, negligent and innocent uh, misrepresentation. Uh, the remedies for uh, misrepresentation, um, the first one is rescission. When a contract has been induced by misrepresentation of any kind, the contract does not, does still confer obligations upon the party, but the contract will be voidable. Voiding the contract at this stage is using the remedy of recession. There are a number of restrictions to use of this remedy. There are no bars to recession. The next one is affirm affirmation. Affirmation um, results in the continuation of the contract. Once the contract has been affirmed, the contract can no longer be rescinded. Um, affirmation can occur expressly or impliedly by word or conduct. Care should therefore be taken as a representee may affirm a contract without intending to. For example, if the representee discovers the misrepresentation but does not do anything about it for a long time, they may be taken to have affirmed the contract. It is therefore crucial that the legal advice from commercial solicitors is sought as soon as the misrepresentation is dis discovered, as in the case of Long against Lloyd 1958, which was to do the sale of goods. I'm gonna just go through uh, the facts of this case. Um, 
uh, even though you can actually uh, press on the link uh, to get the facts of the case, but the facts are that the plaintiff was a haulage contractor who saw an advert for the sale of a lorry, which was described as in exceptional condition. The plaintiff saw the vehicle the following day and the defendant stated that the lorry could drive at 40 miles per hour. Also during a test drive, the defendant stated that the vehicle did 11 miles to the gallon. The plaintiff noticed defects on the vehicle and purchased the vehicle for a reduced price, paying half of the cost that day. Two days later, the plaintiff drove the vehicle and discovered serious issues and the petrol tank was eight miles to the gallon rather than 11 and told the defendant. Following this, the plaintiff allowed his brother to take the lorry on a business trip where it again had broken down. The plaintiff brought an action to rescind the contract on the basis of innocent misrepresentation. The issue that was identified in this case was that uh, the court, for the court was to establish under the circumstances that the plaintiff could rescind the contract for the sale of the lorry between the parties. Specifically, this required the court to consider the statements made by the defendant regarding the condition of the lorry. It was held that the court actually, in this case, rejected the claim of the plaintiff. It was held that innocent misrepresentation allowed the plaintiff to rescind after the contract had been executed but the plaintiff would lose such a right after the goods had been accepted. In sending the lorry on business trip with his brother, the plaintiff has construed final acceptance of the vehicle and therefore lost the right to rescind the agreement. In the event of misrepresentation, it is expected that representee, if they are not happy with the contract, will take action to remedy this contract. Lapse of time. There is a differing approach by courts for differing types of misrepresentation. In the case of fraudulent misrepresentation, the lapse of time will begin at the time the fraud was either discovered, discovered or could have been discovered. As for uh, misrepresentation, which is negligent or innocent, the lapse of time will begin from the date of the contract, uh, as in the case of Leaf International Galleries, 19, uh, Leaf against International Gallery, Galleries, 1950 and, and there's a link to this case as well that you could have a look at so I'll just give you a little bit on the facts of the case so the facts are that Mr Leaf the claimant purchased a painting from the defendants after five years he discovered that though innocently the defendants had misrepresented that the painting was by constable Consequently, Mr. Leaf sought to rescind the contract on the ground of innocent misrepresentation and the breach of condition. The issue that was identified in this case was that could Mr. Leaf claim the recession rescission of the contract five years after the successive purchase of the painting? The Court of Appeal held that under Section 35 of the Sale of Goods Act 1893, the claimant was deemed to have accepted the painting. Since five years was a period of time reasonable enough for the plaintiff to have intimidated rejection if he was willing to do so. Due to the lapse in time, he was not entitled to any more, uh, entitled any more to rescind the contract, neither on the ground of breach of contract condition, nor on the basis of innocent representation. Restitutionary indic Room. This bar to recession refers to where a recession of the contract is no longer possible. Uh, this is the case where the goods undertake the contract have been used, consumed or have been perished. Um, as in the case of Clark and Dixon, again, uh, you can press onto the link to get the facts of the case. This was an 1858 case. I'll give you a little bit on the facts of the case. The plaintiff brought this his claim for money had and received by the purchase of shares in the company. He said that he'd not, he had been induced to purchase the shares by fraudulent misrepresentation, but he failed in his action at common law. It was held by uh, Justice Earl. The plaintiff could not avoid the contract under which he took the shares because he could not restore them in the same state as when he took them. Um, Justice Cropton went, uh, stated that when once it is settled that a contract induced by fraud is not void, but voidable at the option of the party defrauded it. It seems to me to follow that when the party exercises 
it is his option to rescind the contract, he must be in a state to rescind it, and that is he must be in such a situation as to the able to put the parties into their original state before the contract. The plaintiff must rescind in total or not total or not at all. He cannot keep both the shares and recover the whole price. That is founded on the, plain uh, the plainest principles of justice. If he cannot return the article, he must keep it and sue for his real damage in action of deceit. The court considered whether a party can avoid a contract uh, procured by duress in circumstances where he cannot aff offer the other party substantial restitute in integrum and it was held that unless the claimant could offer counter restitution the remedy um, may be incomplete. Um, and then in the event that the goods have only been partially consumed, recession is a more complicated issue and the case to look at is the TSB Bank Limited case in Camfield and then the case of De Mollestein and Ponton 2002, the approach was rejected and it was argued that a partial recession may be possible where uh, you can split the contract into multiple, multiple parts. Third party interest where, excuse me, rescission would encroach on the rights of a third party. This re remedy will be unavailable and as in the case of Crystal Palace Football Club 2000, uh, limited against uh, Dowie 2007. Um, and there's a link there to the case that you can have a look at in your own time. Um, and the damages, uh, the measure of damages differs for each type of misrepresentation, misrepresentation, therefore each will be considered in turn. Fraudulent misrepresentation, uh, a fraudulent misrepresentation requires a high standard of proof as in the case of Doyle and Olby Ironmongers Limited 1969, um, is an authority to the effect that damages are awarded on the tortious basis aiming to put the aggrieved party in the position they would have been if the misrepresentation was um, untrue. Sorry, the misrepresentation was true. Um, and then this standard is usually subject to a test of reasonable foreseeability where a loss will only be claimed if the statement maker could have reasonable for, reasonably foreseen that the fraudulent statement would have resulted in such a loss. And there's a link there for you to go on to the case. Negligent misrepresentation under the common law is negligent misrepresentation claimed under Headley, Bryan and Heller. Um, and the tort of deceit are extremely limited in the comparison to those for fraudulent misrepresentation. Unlike damages for fraudulent misrepresentation under the tort of deceit, the damages are limited by the test of remote, remoteness. The test of remoteness from the overseas tank ship limited company um, only allows damages to be claimed that are reasonably foreseeable. If the claimant has also been negligent to some extent, damages may be reduced by way of contributory negligence apportioning some of the blame to the claimant. Under section two, subsection one of the Misrepresentation Act, damages are awarded on exactly the same basis as fraudulent misrepresentation. Therefore, the, sub, the statement maker will be liable in damages for all consequential losses as the result of the statement, irrespective, irrespective of their force foreseeability, as in the case of uh, Shaney Wood Supplies Limited against uh, Edge 1987, and you, there's a link there for you to go on to the case. I'll just tell you a little bit of the facts of the case. In this case, the complainant had entered into a contract to purchase land from the defendant. In this contract, it was expressly stated that there would be a vacant possession on completion of the agreement, and this would be ensured by the defendant. However, the current occupants of the land refused to leave and they, uh, they claimed for business tenancy benefits under the Landlord and Tenancy Act 1954 in the course of agreeing the contract. The defendant had not served notice onto the tenants regarding vac vacating the land. The issue identified in this case was that um, whether there was misrepresentation in the contract by the defendant regarding the vacant possession on completion of the agreement with the complainant. Another issue was that whether the complainant 
would be entitled to a remedy if the defendant was found liable. The decision that was held uh, was uh, the outcome in this case that it was held by the court that the defendant was liable to pay damages to the complainant for failing to make sure of vacant possession at the time of completion of the contract under section 2 subsection 1 of the misrepresentation act 1967 he had not served notice to the tenants nor had he offered to buy out the tenants interest to fulfill the contract with the complainant the occupant did have a legal right under the landlord and tenant act 1954 to remain in the occupation of the land Section 2, subsection 2 of the Misrepresentation Act clarifies the relationship between recession and damages. The courts have identified that recession can often result in unfair consequences and therefore damages may be awarded as an alternative to recession. This means that there cannot be a claim for recession and damages. It must be one or another. Uh, 3M2 contrasts the effects of misrepresentation and mistake on a contract. If the statement amounts to a term of the contract which is not fulfilled, the innocent party may sue for the breach of contract. If the statement is merely a representation which turns out to be untrue, the innocent party may bring an action for misrepresentation. A misrepresentation is a false statement of fact or law which induces a representee to enter in a contract where statement is made during the course of negotiations is classed as representation rather than a term. An action for misrepresentation may be available where the statement turns out to be untrue. There are three types of misrepresentation, as mentioned earlier, innocent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation and fraudulent misrepresentation. The effect of finding a misrepresentation is the contract is voidable. Uh, the contract, uh, for example, the contract exists but may be set aside by the representee. The remedy available depends on depends on the type of misrepresentation, but generally consists of recession or damages. The right to rescind the contract may be lost in the same cir some circumstances. The law relating to misrepresentation is mainly found in common law with the Misrepresentation Act 1967, providing some further details. Recession contract law remedy bars representation, mistake and fraud. Recession is a remedy made available when the underlying basis for making a contract is fundamentally tainted. Some conduct on behalf of a contracting party under, undermines the very reason that the other party made the contract in the first place. The contract may can be rescinded at the option of the affected party. The remedy of rescission means that an entire contract is set aside. For legal purposes, it is treated as though it was never made. It never took place. The outcome of rescission is that whatever was done by the parties by making the contract is reversed. Uh, the parties are put back in the position they would have been in as if the contract never ever never even been made that's the status quo ante it's treated as non-existing the transaction established by the contract is brought to an end with res retrospective effect when the right to rescind is available and the properly exercised is said that the contract has been rescinded these case that the cases where recession was available even when the contract has been put fully performed Recession. This sets aside the contract and prim prim primarily aims to put the parties back in the original position as if the contract had never been made. Rescission can be sought for all cases of misrepresentation. However, this is a discretionary uh, remedy, meaning that the courts will not always allow a party to rescind and the injured party may lose the right to rescind if they a he has already affirmed the contract. B, he does not act to rescind in a reasonable time. C, it is or becomes impossible to return the parties back to their original position. Or D, a third party has acquired legal rights as a result of the original contract. Indemnity is where the court may order party uh, payment for expenses necessarily incurred in complying with the terms of the contract. Um, damages this remedy varies according to the type of misrepresentation. In fraudulent misrepresentation cases, there's an automatic right to damages. 
in negligent cases, the injured party may claim damages under common law or under Misrepresentation Act 1967, subsection 2.1. In the situations of innocent misrepresentation, the court has discretion whether to award damages and may opt to award damages in lieu of recession. Mistakes. So the, the effect, the effect of mistake on the validity of a contract depends on the type and nature of the mistake made. The general rule is that there were a mistake where a mistake has been made by the parties at common law, the contract may be deemed void as if the contract had never existed. Equity takes a more flexible approach in that contracts containing certain mistakes may be treated as voidable, where either party can terminate the contract. However, fundamental mistake often referred to as an operative mistake may render a contract void. There are four types. First one is common mistakes, mutual mistakes, unilateral mistakes, and mistakes as to the identity. So firstly, we'll go through what common mistakes are. Um, one of the main types is common mistake. A common mistake is where both parties uh, mistake, uh, parties are mistaken about about the same thing. They share the shared mistake must be something uh, in which a serious aspect of contract. It cannot be something. Uh, it cannot be about something which is not sufficiently uh, serious. For example, imagine that you enter into a contract to buy a piece of equipment. Additionally, imagine that you and the other party did not realize the equipment did not work. In that case, this is likely to be a sufficiently serious common mistake. In this type of situation, a court might be able to decide that a contract was not created, not created all equally. It may also decide that contract had been created, but your contract is void. This is called a voidable contract. A case in regards to common mistake is a case of Bell and Lever Brothers found that the Bell and Snelling had committed breaches of their contract. They had made co uh, compensation agreements for Bell and Snelling's termination in the belief that the service contracts were valid. Both men had also forgotten about the breaches, so they also believed that their contracts were valid. The court held that the mistake made was not fundamental to render, render the contract void. The next one is mutual mistakes. So this is where a mutual mistake occurs. Um, a mutual mistake occurs. There is a misunderstanding between the parties as to each other's intentions, and they are said to be at cross purposes. A mutual, a mutual mistake negates consent, and therefore no agreement is said to have been formed at all. A uh, case for this is the case of Wood and Scarf, where the defendant was going to lease a pub to the claimant for a 63 year, 63 a year, but this clerk failed to tell the claimant that there was a one-off charge of 500 pounds. The court held the agreement was valid as the defendant had made a precise offer which the claimant had accepted. Unilateral mistakes. A uh, unilateral mistake is where only one party is mistaken and the other party knows about it and takes advantage of the error. A unilateral mistake also negates consent and the existence of an agreement. Unilateral mistake as to the terms of the contract and unilateral mistakes as in regards to the uh, equity. Uh, you could also get unilateral mistake involving uh, the, the next one, which is a mistake as to identity. Uh, this is where a mistake as to the identity of the other party to the contract is made. The contract will be deemed void if the identity of that party is central to the contract. However, where the parties negotiate in person, there's a presumption that there's an intention to do business with the person in their presence, in which it was unlikely that a contract will be void, as demonstrated in the case of Phillips and Brooks, 19, 
19, where a rogue purchased some items from the claimant's jewellery shop, claiming to be Sir George Bullo. He paid to, by cheque and persuaded the jewellers to allow him to take a ring. He gave the address of Sir George Bullock and the jewellers checked the name and matched the address in the directory. The rogue then pawned the ring at the defendant pawnbrokers in the name of Miss Mr. Firth and received £350. He then disappeared without a trace. The claimant bought an action based on unilateral mistake as to the identity. It was held in this case that the contract was not void for mistake. Where the parties transact face to face, the law presumed they intend to deal with the person in front of them, not the person they claim to be. The jewellers were unable to demonstrate that they were uh, they would only have sold the ring to Sir George Bullock. These are some of the references uh, for today's session. So if you have to look at them, please look at them in your own time and the links are there for you to click on. Uh, so today we've looked at learning outcome three and we've looked at misrepresentation, where we looked at misrepresentation and mistake with reference to uh, case law. Um, and please work around this learning outcome three on your assignment. Next week, we will be looking at learning outcome four. Uh, and thank you. Uh, for attending the session today and have a good day. Thank you.